Well, we just came from Eagle Mountain, got to visit some with Pastor, uh, Brother Copeland, and, and uh, he, his prophecy for 2017 is he said it will be a year of fabulous outpourings from heaven. So Pastor George gave me that. The year of fabulous outpourings from heaven. All right, let's try that. 2017 will be the year of fabulous outpourings from heaven. Amen. A a year of fabulous outpouring, extraordinary, uh, notable miracles and the move of the spirit and people being healed and the the children and the adults, the whole family blessed. He said it will not be anything like you thought. It'll be greater than you have ever seen before. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and laugh about that. Say, ah, 2017 be a year of fabulous outpouring from heaven. Amen. Times of refreshing coming from the presence of God, the glory of God hitting. Hallelujah. And uh, we were there Sunday night and uh, uh, they pulled up an old video of Dad Hagen ministering in St. Louis and Brother Copeland sitting on the front row and and the glory kind of started hitting there and and Dad Hagen stood there and started laughing. <laughs> Brother Copeland jumped up and started dancing. So we showed that video and then the whole row was dancing. I think they, all, all that section, we were all dancing and rejoicing. And, um, Dad Hagen was laughing and, and uh, he said, uh, the glory of God is hitting our nation and our generation. And so uh, I played the video. It was so much fun uh, that I played it again. And then I played it again. I played it four times. <laughs> and so I asked Pastor George to send it to me so I can play it maybe tomorrow or the next day. But uh, a fa- fabulous, outstanding move of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God just hit that place. And so I'm expecting some, wow, even this year, the best things ever happened. Amen. Coming in the end of this year, your best miracles hadn't even happened yet. Praise the Lord. Come on, there's a breakthrough in revelation, a breakthrough in understanding, the eyes of our understanding enlightened. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I already got one runner. Praise the Lord. I'm glad this is a smaller auditorium. Praise the Lord. I mean, I just pick a section and run myself when I run. <laughs> when I was younger, I'd do the whole thing. Now I just kind of pick that one section. Let the young people run. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we want to prepare ourselves for extraordinary year that's coming up. We want to prepare ourselves on the inside, outside, every area uh, to see God do things. Maybe you've prepared your whole life for the next 12 months. I said, maybe you prepared your whole life and the greatest manifestation will happen in the next 12 months, 2017. Amen. Just coming up. You're coming up on the greatest year of your life. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's pray together. We're going to get into the word and trust the Lord. He gets us ready, expands us and strengthens us. Praise the Lord. And um, uh, this came to me this morning that um, uh, I studied the Civil War, the, the videos from uh, Ken Burns. Listen to him, watched him over and over. And he said, the reason that Robert E. Lee lost at Gettysburg was because he was fighting blind. He was fighting blind. That his cavalry man, Jeb Stewart, was out doing some special stuff and he was supposed to show show up and tell him where the strengths and weaknesses were, you know, of the uh, Union Army. And he didn't show up. He actually showed up late and came up with some uh, 200 or wagons or something. And Robert, he said, they're useless to me now. So he lost at Gettysburg because he was fighting blind. And Trina had uh, a vision, what was a few years ago, about uh, the birthday party where they get the pinata out and they are swinging at the pinata and it's full of candy and stuff like that. And then you got a uh, blindfold, right? And you're swinging. And so you only hit it every once in a while. But we just saw the Lord remove that blindfold. So I believe you will not be fighting blind. 
Come on, the eyes of your understanding will be flooded with light. Come on, your vision will be clear. Amen. Your understanding and a breakthrough in understanding, a breakthrough in vision and strength from the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's pray about that. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy today. Thank you for every person that's here. We ask you to give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of God, the eyes of our heart the eyes of our understanding flooded with light that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe according to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead, set him at your own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power, might, dominion, every name is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and you put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. We thank you, Lord, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that we will we'll increase in the knowledge of God. We'll have breakthroughs in our understanding in the ways and purposes and plans of God for our lives. We thank you for that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we trust the Holy Spirit to work in us. And Lord, we thank you that you're working in us both the will and do of your good pleasure. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. All right, let's start off with Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. And we're going to talk some about faith in the blood of Jesus. Amen. And some about being a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. Hebrews 13, verse 20, 21 says, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So underline that in your Bible, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, that he makes you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Praise the Lord. Amen. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant that God makes us perfect. Now, the word perfect, uh, I like the Amplified Bible. It says that he equips you with everything you need to do his will. He equips you with everything you need to do his will. Amen. Amen. That's a pretty good confession, isn't it? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, God is working in you, equipping you with everything you need to do his will. Or he uses that word, he makes you perfect. That means he gets you in the right place at the right time with the right people. And when you get there, you say, Lord, you must have done that because that was just perfect. Amen. Amen. Or you could use the word where he says in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, that he says you walk circumspectly before the Lord. Circumspect. When he says walk circumspectly before the Lord, uh, the word circumspect literally means that you are uh, careful or cautious or actually means that you are accurate before the Lord. Circumspect simply means you're uh, watching what's going on around you and it says, and that you're filled with the knowledge of his will. In other words, you're circumspect, accurate. In other words, you're not just in some permissive area, but you're right accurate where God wants you at the right time at the right place. And you're not only accurate in that place, but you're accurate in your attitude. Praise the Lord. Amen. That God's working in you. Amen. And uh, Philippians 2 13 says, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now I had to confess that a lot as a teenager. Because it says, God's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. One translation says, he is energizing and creating in you both the desire and the power to do his will. You say, why? Well, because sometimes you didn't feel like you could do the will of God. And it says, and God's energizing, giving you the power, the ability to do it. And then sometimes you just really didn't even have the want to. 
the desire. So I had to say all the time, <laughs> God's working in me. He gives me the desire, the want to, and the ability to do his will. In other words, it's, uh, uh, actually, uh, it starts off, I think the Amplified Bible says, not in your own strength, for it is God that works in you. All right, let's try that again. Not in your own strength, for it is God that works in you. Amen. And uh, I think the Amplifier says, something says, it is God himself that works in you. Not in your own strength. Because the verse right ahead of it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, work out your own literally is the word for exercise or workout. In other words, you're going to have to take what's in you, and work it out into your life and your time and your relationships and the will of God for your life. Work out, and he says, with fear and trembling. Actually, other translations say, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, and timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. Amen. All right, let's try that again. Come on, the Amplified Bible says, with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might grieve the Holy Spirit or offend God or discredit the name of Christ. Because it's important, your life, your assignment, what you do. So he says, work that out on your own because nobody else can do that for you. So he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But notice the next verse, not in your own strength. For it is God himself that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I love some other translations. He's energizing and creating in you the desire and the power to do his will. Amen. All right, let's try that again. It is God himself. Come on, it is God. That's right. Himself, the Spirit of God, same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It is God personally present, working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Well, that would be a pretty good confession, wouldn't it? Come on, when you feel like things are not just going your way, you say, oh, it is God himself is working in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And through the blood of the everlasting covenant, he makes me perfect in every good work to do his will while he works in me that which is well-pleasing in his sight. You say, well, I don't feel that way. Well, we know better. You don't go by your feelings anyway. You disagree with God. You say, God's working in me, energizing and creating in me the desire and the power to do his will. He makes me perfect, which simply means that accurate, come on, his perfect will, his perfect plan, and helps me to bring me right into the, his perfect plan, accurate, right place, right time, and he equips me with everything I need to do his will. I'll just go ahead and laugh about that for a minute. Praise the <laughs> Lord. Amen. Amen. He equips you with everything you need to do his will, which would not only include what you would call natural equipment, but spiritual equipment. Amen. Everything you need to do his will, he's working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Amen. Now, if you go over to 2 Timothy real quickly here, he says uh, about being a vessel of honor, accurate, perfect. How many believe that God can perfect that which concerns you? Amen. He will perfect that which concerns you. Praise the Lord. Amen. He performs that which is appointed for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. I had this experience years ago when we were... <clears throat> traveling, our kids were little and we, and we uh, bought this motor home, you know. So we bought a motor home, took all my money to buy the motor home so our family could travel together and we'd go east coast for three or four months, come back, go to the west coast, go north, south. So we did that for years when our kids were little. So the motor home we bought happened to be what's called a four travel motor home, F-O-R-E, four travel, make them in Nacogdoches, Texas, and a very fine motor home and pretty expensive motor homes. Uh, and they get more expensive every year. I think today they're probably $800,000 to get one of those motor homes they're pretty nice. So uh, <clears throat> we got a nice motorhome, but I'm telling you, when I, after I bought the motorhome, I was like totally broke. 
back in those days, the four travel motor homes were made and they were white and they had an orange stripe and kind of a burnt orange stripe, kind of a little brown burnt orange stripe. So they had orange, burnt orange stripe. And uh, <clears throat> so I spent all my money on uh, the motor home. Well, you know how you go. If you go to RV park, you know, and you go preach at a church for three days, you don't have to unhook everything, go to the meetings every night. So I needed a car to pull behind it. So I didn't have any money, so I'm pretty much out of money. So <clears throat> um, uh, we were fixing to leave to go to Tucson. Then we're going to Yuma, Arizona from, you know, South Texas from Houston area. And so uh, we had a couple of days. So I, 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 the guy in my dad's church, he had a Ford Pinto that he was working on. And it had like a rusty, you know, front and back and the fenders were different colors, you know, and the back seat was kind of eaten out, it's kind of rotten. And, and uh, but he had been working on it and he said, I can sell that to you for $400. So I said, well, you know, I can afford that. <clears throat> so I came home, told Trent, I said, you know, I have found a car that we can tow behind our motor home. <laughs> you know, I can pay cash for it, you know, I got it. And so I told her which one it was and she said, you are not going to pull that car behind that nice motor. Home. So I said, uh, well, what are we going to do? I don't have any money. I mean, we're out of money. Got a nice motor home here, but I have no money and we need a car. So what am I going to do? She said, we're going to pray. I said, oh, let's come to that. So <laughs> since we, <laughs> we began to pray, Lord, you provide us, you know, with a vehicle and, and all that in Jesus name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. She was probably more in faith than I was. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, um, I said, Lord, you know, if you could put it on quick order, it'd be nice. I got like three days. So I went back and told the guy, I said, you know, I can't buy the car. He said, uh, uh, how come? I said, well, none of your business. But I don't want to tell him, you know, my wife wouldn't let me buy it. So, <clears throat> a good old fixer upper, you know, I could have fixed it up. Just take me a while, a few years maybe. But, uh, man, uh, we got in a motorhome headed out to Arizona. So we're driving out there, you know, it takes about 20 hours to drive out there. And we got out there, uh, uh, I guess we did the first meeting in um, Tucson. Then we went to Yuma, Arizona, which is a hot, hot desert. Got out there the first night of the meeting and a, a guy in the church came up to me and said, the Lord told me to give you a car. Well, you know, I'm a preacher's kid, you know. So I said, well, let's go look at it. Because <laughs> I've seen the kind of stuff people give and I'm like, we'll see if it's the Lord or the devil. So let's go look at it. <laughs> so he could see that look on my face, you know, like, and he said, oh, you're going to like it. He said, it's brand new. Well, now my face is under it. It's brand new. He said, I just bought it for my wife and she doesn't like it because it's a standard or a five speed. Now I'm brightening up even more. Perfect for a motorhome, right? For towing. And so he said, oh, you're really going to like it brand new. So, so it's, I said, well, let's go look at it right now. So we went over to his house and sure enough, he pulled up the garage door. When he pulled up the garage door, there was sitting a brand new Toyota very few miles on it, and it was white with an orange stripe and a burnt orange stripe. When he pulled that door up, I said, there is a God. Because i never seen that guy before, and I've never seen him since. And the Lord had that thing prepared and prearranged. But I was fixing to settle for a fixer-upper when God had something that would be perfect. I said, God has something that's absolutely perfect. Amen. And he'll make you perfect in every good work to do his will. In other words, when you see that, you'll say, Lord, you must have prearranged and prepared that ahead of time because that is absolutely perfect. Hmm. So now in this process of God working in us, he works in our heart, in our attitude. He perfects that which concerns us. Thank God he never gives up on us. Come on, God has a reputation for working with some real losers and making them champions. 
Uh, don't look at anybody right now, but I said, God has a reputation for working with some real losers. He picked some real doozies, right? There's always somebody surprised that God could use you. Probably somebody said, behind every successful man stands a good wife and a surprised mother-in-law. So, uh, God's working in us. All right, let's see where we can go from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, in verse 21, if a man therefore will prepare or purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet are prepared for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Just underline that in your Bible. So he says in the house, verse 20, some vessels to honor, some to dishonor. In other words, God will use you. But he said, if a person will purge himself. So look at that. He's actually given you and I the power to hear, he says, purge yourself. Deal with yourself. Cleanse yourself. Come on. I've, as a pastor, I've dealt with some pretty difficult people. And some people giving me trouble. But nobody's given me as much trouble as I've given myself. Some of the most difficult people I've ever dealt with do not compare to what it's like to dealing with me. So I have great mercy for people. Sometimes I have to look in the mirror and say, I'm talking to you. And I'm tired of your attitude. And don't look down while I'm talking to you. Look at me. And you can move to some other state, but the problem is, is you've got to take yourself with you. So you might as well kill that giant right now, or he'll follow you for 10 years. Are y'all still with me? So even though you're a new creature in Christ, when you're the righteousness of God in Christ, he says still that God works in you, in your attitude, in your desires, and he prepares you to be a vessel of honor. What does that mean? A vessel of honor sanctified means that he has prepared you and set you apart for a special use. Amen. If you've ever been to any museums, history museums, then you'll go in there and you'll see like a, a, an ink pen or you'll see a book or you'll see a chair and it looks like a pretty regular chair or ink pen, come on, or a book, or a regular cup, but it says, President so-and-so used that cup. Amen. Or so-and-so sat in that chair. And it looks like a regular chair, but once that president Use that chair. It looks like a pretty ordinary chair. But once that president used that chair, that's a set apart chair. You know, in my house, I've got one chair from my dad's office. And that chair, leather chair, that my dad set in, and that sits in a special place in our house. And sometimes I just walk through the house, and I see my dad's chair. My dad's has gone to heaven. He pastored for 50 years, much better pastor than I ever was. So uh, sometimes I'll see that chair, and I just go, sit in that chair. Now, it may look like a pretty ordinary chair, but when the grandkids are playing around the house, I'll say, now y'all leave that chair alone because that's my daddy's chair and that's the chair he sat in and that makes that an extraordinary chair. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Then if I go preach for, for Stan Moore in Miami and Stan Moore is now probably 85, 90 years old. So we'll go back in the ministry room before we go out to preach and, and he'll come in there and he's, he says, uh, he says, sit in, sit in that chair right there and let's talk. He said, cause that's where uh, dad Hagen sat in that chair when he was here. He's, Stay here for two weeks at a time. He always sat in that chair. Sit in that chair right there. Well, it, it don't really look like a special chair, you know, a little kind of a floppy little chair. But what, I like to just sit in that chair. Why? Because that's a chair he used. And you may look like a pretty ordinary person. But if you're used by God, 
and God uses you and the Spirit of God flows through you. Come on, you may look a little ordinary and a little too ordinary sometimes, but if somebody knows you, they'll say, watch out now how you talk to that person because God used that man or used that woman and that makes them a vessel of honor. Woo. Come on, anybody here say, I'd like to be a vessel of honor. In other words, God can use all kinds of people, you know, in all kinds of ways. But he said there is a difference between somebody who actually purges themselves and prepares themselves to be a vessel of honor, prepared, meet, ready for the master's use. Abraham Lincoln said, I will study and I will prepare and my opportunity will come. Let's try that again. I will study, I will prepare, and my opportunity will come. Well, you know how many times he failed and failed and failed and failed again, and yet when he became president, literally changed our whole nation. Y'all still here? So I will study, I will prepare. How are you gonna do that? He says God himself is gonna work in you by his grace, amen, and by his word and by his spirit, and he's gonna sanctify you. Word sanctify means I'm gonna separate you from what you used to be and how you used to think and how you used to act and I'm gonna consecrate you unto God and though you may look ordinary, God's gonna use you in your generation and make you a vessel of honor. You will supply something in your generation that will change a nation or change a city or change a church. So in the sanctification process, I want to look at exactly how this happens. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 real quickly here because, again, I believe God's working in you. I said God's working in you. I said God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's making you a vessel of honor ready to be used by God. Hallelujah. Amen. Special occasion. Woo. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Let's read this. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. But look at this phrase right here. The sanctification of the Holy Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice the connection here between your sanctification and your obedience. <laughs> your obedience. Amen. God, now, some of us have uh, delayed obedience. Some of us have, have uh, partial obedience. <laughs> he says... But to be obedient to the will of God, the plan of God for your life, he said, there's going to be the working of the Holy Spirit and there's going to be the <laughs> sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Notice the connection between the blood, the application of the blood, and the work of the Holy Spirit. The blood, the sprinkling of the blood, the application of the Holy Spirit, that he's working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Now notice, he's not just working around you, he's actually working in you. Amen. All right, now let's try that a little bit more. That means he's working in you, that means by his spirit in your innermost being and in your personality. All right, so you're not just stuck with the personality you got. Come on, God is working in you in your inner man. Come on, the desire and the power Praise the Lord. Changing your desires and working in you, in your inner man, two ways, the sprinkling of the blood and by what? The work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we want to look at this because wherever the blood flows, the Holy Spirit goes. Or you could say it this way. The blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. Where you honor the blood, the Holy Spirit will work. Where the Holy Spirit's working, he'll always honor the blood of Jesus. Actually, you could say it this way. The, the devil can tolerate a lot of stuff that goes on, goes on in church. 
He can tolerate it. But the moment you start honoring the blood of Jesus, come on and singing about the blood and, and declaring the power of the blood, he'll start packing up his stuff and kind of getting out of town. But he can tolerate a lot of other stuff. But the moment you start honoring the blood, because the blood of Jesus has cleansing power, but it also has a sanctifying power. Woo, all right, all right, let's go over here to, uh, <laughs> well, let's do Hebrews chapter 10. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's just taking me longer, a little bit longer. Y'all listen kind of slow, so we'll get to this in just a second. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> Thank God for the blood. All right, Hebrews chapter 10. Now, if you don't mind, can I read some of this? I'm going to read some of this. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read all the way down to verse 25. Woo! For the law, Hebrews chapter 10, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the, the comers thereunto perfect. Everybody say perfect. The comers really means the worshipers. Other translations say those who are making their way into God's presence. And he says, and the law could not do what was necessary could not make them perfect. Verse two, for then they would not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Now, if you underline their Bible, he said, if it would have worked, then the worshipers would have no more conscience of sin. Or you could say, if the Old Testament sacrifice would have worked, the goal would have been to remove sin consciousness. Our guilt, our one translation would have no more unworthy feeling, or one translation says they would no longer be haunted by the sense of sin. Hmm. I'm glad you're not haunted by the sense of sin. But he says the Old Testament couldn't produce that. Verse three he says, for in those sacrifices there's a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore then he cometh into the world. He saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast had no pleasure. Verse seven, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Notice this is what Jesus declaring here. I came, it's written in the book to do thy will, O God. God. Verse eight, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein that they are offered by the law. Verse nine, then said he, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Hmm. By the which will we are what? Sanctified, that means separated, made holy, where we surrender, yield ourselves to God, amen? And the sanctification process, he says, by his will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all, verse 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering often, oftentimes in the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for our sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever those those who are sanctified for by one offering. What does that mean? One translation says he was the perfect sacrifice by the perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. For by one offering forever, he made us holy. And one translation says, and brought us into perfect union with God. <laughs> Verse 15. All right, now let's get the Holy, Holy Spirit involved here. You ready? And the Holy Ghost. Everybody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. He said, the Holy Ghost is a witness to us for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Let's try that again. In this new covenant, God said, I'm going to put my laws in their hearts, in their nature. And then he said, in their mind, I'm going to write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Verse 18, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. In other words, he said, what Jesus did, he did it once. And now sin has gone into remission. 
Now, when he says sin's gone into remission, the word remission means more than forgiveness. It means the cancellation of penalty and the removal of guilt. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our body washed with pure water. Hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another another, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice he says that you and I now, because of the blood of Jesus, that we can draw near, draw near, Come boldly, draw near. One translation says, press closer and closer to the Father. Draw near. Now, why would God be giving us that invitation? Draw near, press closer and closer to the Father. It's like you're pressing in closer and closer into fellowship with God, and that'll bring you into more accuracy of the will of God for your life. You press in closer. In other words, come on, you get past your feelings and past the past and past circumstances and you, pat, and you, uh, and you press right in, kind of like the woman that's your blood, and you press right in. Hallelujah. Come on, while everybody else is kind of around Jesus, you're the one that receives from Jesus. You press right in. And he says, let us draw near with a what? True heart. What else? Full assurance of faith. What's full assurance of faith mean? One translation says, we must come with the most cheerful expectation of his blessing. All right, now let's see if we can get you in there in full assurance of faith. So now we're going to come in by the blood. And we're going to come in and press closer and closer to the Father. Come on. And we're going to cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, you're my Father. And we're going to press in closer because he's the one that is perfecting what concerns you. He's the one that's working in you. So I come boldly and I come with what? A true heart, right? And that means my motives and my purposes and my heart now. And now I come in with full assurance of faith means no doubt. No wavering. Full assurance, confidence of faith. Woo, I believe God sure like to see somebody come in like that, just like. Full assurance of faith. And notice he says, and your heart or your conscience is purged from an evil conscience. He says, your heart's purged from an evil conscience and your body is washed with pure water. Now, so that means something's gonna happen in the deepest part of your soul. Let's see if we can't get this right here, all right? Now y'all pray for me because I wanna try to get this just right. I said, something's gonna happen in the deepest part of your personality, of your soul. Now listen close. Smith Wigglesworth said, there's not one thing in me the blood does not cleanse. Through faith in the blood of Jesus and through the application of that blood and the work of the Holy Spirit, he's going to reach into your conscience and remove sin consciousness and guilt and shame, or he will silence the voice of self-condemnation that paralyzes you and keeps you from moving forward in the will of God in your life. And he said, and the blood reaches into your conscience and produces a righteousness consciousness that God's on your side for the blood's been applied. So now that blood reaches into your conscience and not only removes sin, but removes the stain of sin, the guilt of sin, the shame of sin, and the smell of sin. So now you're coming in to the holy place in the presence of God. Come on, in the holiest, 
Where's the holiness? It's a place in his presence. It's a place in the spirit and you come walking in. Listen, and it's really not that far from you. You don't even have to have four wheel drive to get in there. I'm going to show you how to get in there. I see. All right. You come pressing in and get past your feelings, get past all your failures and all of your inadequacies and all the things you think about yourself and you come in by the blood of Jesus. And that blood, he says, purges you from an evil conscience or from sin consciousness. In other words, what makes the new covenant so very different than the old covenant is what Jesus did. He did it once because it was the perfect sacrifice and it has the power to perfect everything that concerns you externally, but also internally. All right, let's try that again. There's not one thing in me the blood does not cleanse. In other words, not one area Y'all pray for me while I say this and reach out your hands and ask God to give me boldness. There's not one area of your stubborn, ignorant, rebellious self that the blood cannot reach and change and sanctify and bring you into a place of perfect surrender to the will of God for your life and the Holy Spirit will occupy anywhere the blood has reached. Once the blood reaches it, the Spirit of God occupies it and you can forget your old personality because God's got a new heart in you, new desires, new plans for you. Come on, he can change your attitude and those deep things that would keep you from obeying God. Come on, I said the blood can reach that and change that. Hallelujah. Now I'm gonna show you how it does it. Are you ready? Come on, we're talking about being sanctified to be a, a vessel of honor. Because promotion don't come from man. It don't matter how good your brochure is and your website. Promotion comes from God. And no matter how cute you are, how good your voice is, come on, until the Holy Spirit anoints it and he clears the way, come on, even if you got a jet, come on, if the air traffic control don't give you permission to go to 10,000 or 20,000, you will be grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor, I mean, you know, you think you're really something when you get an airplane or a jet, you're like, I got to be a jet. Then you find out you can't do nothing to the air traffic control, don't say you can <laughs> See, and some people get saved and feel the Holy Ghost. They're like, I got to be a jet. Yeah, but there's still an air traffic control that will ground you if you don't act right. God will turn down the volume on your voice and let you sit there for a while until your attitude gets right. Y'all pray for me right now. Until he can take you to the next level. In other words, he's working in you, in your desire, in your attitude, in your priority, even in your purpose. F.F. Yeah, yeah. Bosworth said, if you want what God wants, for the same reason he wants it, you are invincible. Yeah. All right, let's try this out of here. If you want what God wants, for the same reason he wants it, all right, let's try it again. I said, if you want what God wants, for the same reason he wants it, you are invincible. That means there ain't no devil, nothing can stop you if you want what God wants. For the same reason he wants it. In other words, Wigglesworth said, a lot of people would love to see miracles if they could be seen doing them. Thank you for your enthusiasm. In other words, come on, God works in you. <laughs> I know some of this ain't making you happy, but I believe you'll get happy in just a minute. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, through the sprinkling of the blood, through the work of the Holy Spirit, Years ago, I read an article called The University of Arabia. <laughs> and it said, every man that's ever been used by God had to graduate from the University of Arabia. Moses, Elijah, even the Apostle Paul, and even Jesus himself had to spend 40 days there. 
And Paul spent three years, maybe, maybe 10 years in the wilderness of Arabia. They said, why would God take a man that has seen Jesus and spend years in the wilderness? So why? He said, because when you're in the wilderness, you can lose a lot of things in the wilderness. Number one, like the fear of man. Come on, Jesus told Saul and Paul, he said, he said, I'm gonna deliver you from the people then I'm gonna send you to the people. Come on, God can't send you to nobody as long as you're trying to get along with everybody and please everybody. That's why I'm preaching, I just make a face. People make a face to me, I just go. You didn't hire me and you can't fire me. That means I, you know. I ain't changing my sermon. If you look at your watch, I wonder what time it is. Sorry, Pastor Matt. But anyway, so. <laughs> to be sanctified, prepared for the master's use through the blood. Now I'm gonna show you how he does this. Are you ready for this? Woo, sanctified. Come on, it's in the blood. Hallelujah. Now, I've got this in the book, The Bloodline of a Champion, just added a couple of chapters. But here's, here's the illustration. 2015, the Ebola virus um, broke out. West Africa, we were preaching in Nigeria. We were planning to go some other countries. They closed the borders because everyone was so afraid because it's incurable. So the Ebola virus, incurable, People are dying by the thousands. So the, the best medical experts in the world trying to figure out how to stop this and doctors from America go to Liberia and one of the doctors trying to treat people, he got the Ebola virus. So they didn't know what they're gonna do so they, they, uh, they um, quarantined him, you know, and they got him uh, separated and then they, they flew him back to America. Then they had an experimental drug which they had very, very little of called ZMAP and had been tested on mice and had produced some antibodies. So what they did is they used that ZMAP and then they took those antibodies and injected that doctor with those antibodies and he overcame the Ebola virus because an antibody is a protein cell that has already overcame that infection or that disease. So the way it overcomes, it will surround that infectious cell and it said literally it will bind that cell, surround it and bind it and stop that disease. Then they call an antibody a memory cell because once there's a cell in your body that has overcome that disease, then it carries the memory of how it whipped that disease. So another TV cameraman, he got the Ebola virus. Well, they didn't have any more Z-map, so they just took the blood from the man, the doctor who had overcome the Ebola virus, and they put it into the TV cameraman who had the Ebola virus, and now he, he was cured from it because he got blood that had already overcome that disease. All right, now listen to me. To have faith in the blood of Jesus, Jesus' blood His blood carries the memory of everything he overcame in your behalf, including when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, but your will be done. His blood carries the memory. And he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows how you're feeling when you feel like somebody left you, it's costing too much, it's taking too long. He knows every one of those feelings. Yet without sin means he overcame every one of those situations that any man or woman could ever feel. And his blood carries the memory and the victory over that situation and that temptation. 
All right. His blood, that means you can actually plead the blood of Jesus against yourself. Now, I'm going to try to explain this to you. In other words, when you feel like, I tell you how I feel. <laughs> how I feel right now serving the Lord. I tell you, I'm going to tell you how I feel. Listen. Jesus overcame that feeling of you wanting to quit, come on, of you wanting to stop, or you wanting to find your comfort zone. He went all the way to the cross. That means through faith in his blood, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can say the blood of Jesus carries the sanctifying power or creates in me the same disposition that was in the Lord Jesus Christ when he surrendered himself totally to the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. And when he surrendered himself to the will of God, he humbled himself to become a servant. His blood carries that. And then he humbled himself to the death of the cross. His blood carries that. And God raised him up. In other words, the blood of Jesus carries the antibodies for whatever you're going through. And other people may not even know what you're going through. Because you got that stuff going on, on the inside of you. But when you see that mess coming up, you say, by the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed, I am sanctified, I am righteous, and by that blood, that blood reaches into every part of me, so I will not be stubborn, I will not be hard-headed, I will not resist the Holy Ghost, I will not set out to do what I want to do, I plead the blood of Jesus, and that blood reaches on the inside. Oh, come on now. I said that blood reaches on the inside of me, surrounds the infected little attitude or habit. Oh my God, come on now. You say, well, that runs in my family. I'm fixing to slap you. That don't run in your family. If you are a new creature in Christ, Jesus is your Lord. God is your Father. So God's not interested in just adding something to you. He's interested in making you a whole new creation in Christ. That's what he's done in Christ. But now you must renew your mind with the same stuff God used to recreate your spirit. Praise the Lord. We call this slinging blood everywhere. That means in your process, like Dad Hagen said, the Lord said, I've got four phases of your ministry, four phases. He said, the first phase is about this size right here while he was praying. And he said, and uh, in that phase, it lasted a certain number of years. And then he had a bigger phase, and then he had a bigger phase, and then a real big phase. And he said, and your last and final phase, the fourth phase. He said, but you cannot go from one phase to the next phase, a wider influence until you're obedient. So he said, I was praying one day. Oh, praying. Let's talk about praying. He said, I was praying one day. And while I was praying, he said, I was at the altar. And the Holy Spirit showed me some stuff on the inside of me. And I can't remember exactly what it was. Maybe you remember. But he said it was like an old boot, an old can or something like that. And I said, Lord, what is that? An old boot in there? The Lord said, you'll have to get that out before I can take you to the next phase of what I want. I don't know if there's any old boots in here or not, but just let me tell you this. Through the blood of Jesus and the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, God don't want to just add some information to you this week. Let's try that again. I said, God doesn't want to add just a little bit of information. He wants a radical change happening in these three days that an adjustment, I said, an adjustment is made in your heart, in your inner man, so God can launch you into his perfect will for your life through the blood of Jesus. Are y'all still in there? In other words, the blood carries the memory of Jesus' surrender. So when you're having trouble surrendering to the will of God because of the persecution or the price, you look at Jesus and you say, Lord, your blood. Lord, your blood. I have faith in your blood. I apply your blood. 
So my confession is one of faith. The blood of Jesus purges me from every defilement of the enemy. There's not one thing in me the blood does not cleanse. Let's try that again. I said there's not one thing. There ain't no place that sin can reach. Come on, or your genetics can reach, or your stinking little stubborn self can reach. And I know I can talk to you about this. Come on. My daddy said if they run you out of town, get out in front and make it look like a parade. But let me just tell you this. If they run out of town, we're going to have a parade. But nobody can deal with you like you. Because you know. <laughs> and when you smell a few little attitudes coming around, you're like, all right. I wish I knew somebody I was even talking to. I just feel like I'm talking to the wrong audience. I don't know. I, don't know. I wish there was just somebody here that, that might be having some struggles every now and then that you need to apply the blood of Jesus to to reach on the inside of you because God's wanting to take you up into a greater phase and a greater level of his will. Come on, there's fabulous outpourings of the Holy Spirit and God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So my mom would do it. I'm slinging blood everywhere. She'd plead the blood. I plead the blood. All right, let me read one more thing here, Pastor Mac. I'm sorry, your, your schedule. I, I always mess up schedules and stuff. and I'm, I'm struggling surrendering to the will of God right now. But anyway, I plead the blood right now. So when people say, I have to work on this next time. Anyway, so when it says Jesus touched with the feelings of our infirmities, in other words, he knows how you feel. But we don't walk by our feelings. We walk by faith, but he knows how you feel. Don't ever act like he don't know how you feel. He's like, he just don't understand what I'm going through. Oh yeah, he knows what you're going through. So he says, you hold fast to your confession of faith, but verse 15 says he is touched with the feelings of your infirmity. But you're supposed to hold fast to your confession of faith. But Jesus met that feeling and overcame it all your infirmities. So his blood carries the victory over there. So when people say, how are you feeling? I say, I'm feeling the same way Jesus was feeling when he overcame this feeling. Because I know I'm not supposed to keep confessing my feelings. I'm supposed to confess my faith, but that don't mean he don't know how I'm feeling. So he, he felt the way I'm feeling. And his blood overcame that feeling. So his blood carries the antibodies for me to overcome that feeling or that temptation. Come on, great theological debate. How could Jesus, the divine son of God, be tempted in every way like a man could be tempted? The Bible says he was. And his blood carries the antibodies. So to have faith in the blood, you got to have revelation knowledge of what the blood of Jesus has done, can do, what it'll do in you, what it does in heaven, what it does over the devil, what it reaches into your conscience. The blood of Jesus has power beyond what we even understand right now. I said the blood of Jesus has such tremendous power. Amen. It has power, sanctifying power, healing power, delivering power in the blood. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. I said, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Come on, this week, I want you to sling blood everywhere and say, I'm trusting God for the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart, in my life, that God's gonna expand my territory. He's gonna take me places I've never been. I'm gonna receive things I've never received before. I'm gonna be used by God in ways I ain't never been used before. And you may not look special, but Jesus used that chair. Jesus used that man. Jesus used that woman. Come on, you may look ordinary, but Jesus used you. Jesus used you. Jesus used you, Jesus used you to speak a word in season. Jesus used you. Go ahead and laugh a few minutes. Say, ha, ha, ha. Stand up on your feet, glory to God. My time is up. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a shout, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say, it is God that works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure through the blood of the everlasting covenant. He makes me perfect in every good work to do his will while he works in me that which is well pleasing in his sight. He equips me with everything I need to do his will. By the blood of Jesus, I forget the past. I'm pressing forward in the presence of God. The blood of Jesus purges me from every defilement of the enemy. There's not one thing in me the blood does not cleanse. The blood of Jesus working in me, cleansing me, redeeming my life. Not just once, but every day I live by faith, faith in his blood. And I lift my voice. I lift my voice. The blood of Jesus cleanses me, redeems me, sets me free, gives me victory. And the Holy Spirit works in me. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voice. Thank you, Father. Come on, lift your voice. Thank you, Father. By the blood, by the blood, by the blood. Woo! Praise God. Come on, say by the blood, by the blood, by the blood. I plead the blood. Come on, by the blood, by the blood. I plead, plead the blood. Come on, I wouldn't be here today if it were not for the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Come on, you know. My mama, my mom and daddy pastored 50 years and that, you know, connected to Dad Hagen Ministries and all that stuff. But I hear my mama going through the house. I plead the blood of Jesus. You know, I wouldn't be here today if we're not for mama. She didn't care what nobody thought about her. I bring my friends over from school and she'll still be saying, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. Come on, that there's power in the blood beyond what we can comprehend. But she would just lift her voice, I plead the blood. And you're talking about all hell breaking loose, trying to stop and destroy a family, destroy a marriage, destroy a teenager, destroy children. Come on, destroy and stop. The reason the devil attacks you is you are carrying an important assignment for your generation. But you better be slinging blood everywhere. Come on. Your marriage never would have made it if it were not for somebody having faith in the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Oh, well, we'll take this up later. So get on schedule. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, I'm slinging blood everywhere. Come on, all myself, everybody, my family, I plead the blood. Amen. God bless you, Pastor.